If you're a music lover, you are going to like this show. This is Paul Johnson with The Optimistic American. Today, I have two of the most prolific country and Western music writers on our show. They write music for all different types of people. You'll know their songs if you like country and Western at all. But it's Anna Wilson and Monty Powell. Both of them are a couple. They're married. They write music together. They also have written music separately. They're involved in a variety of different social causes, and they give us kind of an understanding of how uh, social causes sometimes intersect with our music. Now, I'm going to read to you a list of their songs because I think it's worth just knowing the songs that they do sing. Pieces by Rascal Flat. I'll Go Down Loving You by Shenandoah. The Love We Lost by Cheryl Wright. I'm Done by Joe D. Messina. Finish What We Started by Diamond Rio. Words by the Heart by Billy Ray Cyrus, one of my favorites. Dancing Dream by Restless Heart. I'm a Man by Brooks and Dunn. Norma Jean Riley by Diamond Rio. For You, which is a big one by Keith Urban. One of These Days by Tim McGraw that the couple promised to sing on our show today. What a Beautiful Day by Chris Cagle. Sweet Thing by Keith Urban. Days Go By by Keith Urban. Could Have Been Me by Billy Ray Cyrus. Who Wouldn't Want to Be Me by Keith Urban. Kiss a Girl by Keith Urban. The Bus Ride by Susie Boggess. And All I Ever Wanted by Chuck Weiss. Now, again, that's just a partial list of their songs. And they're going to go through with you the songwriting process as well as kind of their inspiration for making different songs. You know, we see our goal at The Optimistic American to help rekindle the American spirit. These two people have done a bunch to rekindle the American spirit. But if you like what we do, we hope that you'll push that like button, push the subscribe button, or maybe even go to optamerican.com uh, and become one of our premium subscribers. But either way, we appreciate having you, and we always love to hear your comments so we know if we're providing you with the type of product you want. Again, on with our show. Monty and Anna, I just want to welcome you to the Optimistic American Show. I'm so excited about having you on here today. Well, we're glad to be here. <laughs> glad to be here. All right. So I've I got to know this story before I can uh, go into talking about music. The two of you, you're both writers in your own right. How is it that you two end up running into one another? And was it like love at first sight or did it end up being like love at the first note? Uh, I think it was more love at the first note. Um, <laughs> I was, uh, I'm 11 years older than Anna. And so I was already in Nashville and, uh, she came and was actually working on the publicity side for a band that I was producing called Diamond Rio. Uh, and we met backstage at one of their shows underneath a tent in the pouring rain, which is how everyone meets in Nashville, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's a song in there. Uh, it, look, trust me, there's been a lifetime of songs yes. <laughs> in that meeting. So. But yeah, we were working for the same band. All right. And so that's where you first meet. So tell me about the uh, the love story first. I want to know, like, uh, when did you guys kind of know that you were right for each other? Well, it, you know, it was a little bit of a, a long and winding road and yet not. I mean, our very first sort of once we met under that tent and realized that we were working, you know, in the same circles, um, it quickly became apparent that I was doing publicity, but I really wanted to be a songwriter. And he was the producer and also a songwriter of the band Diamond Rio. So long and short, it eventually wound up that we start wrote a song together. So he's like, well, why don't we just try to write a song? And I was like, okay, that'd be great. And we wrote our first song and then we wrote our second song. And I think at about the second song, we realized what's going on here. <laughs> and so I guess you could say yeah. it started, you know, with songwriting. <laughs> like, like the great Nashville saying, it all begins with, with a song. song. <laughs> For each of you, uh, tell me when you got your first break. What was the first break that you ended up getting in the business? Well, I, I got there first and, and came early. And my first break came meeting uh, the great songwriter and producer, Tim Dubois, who uh, wrote uh, When I Call Your Name for uh, Vince Gill. And he was managing Vince Gill and Restless Heart at the time. 
and we actually shared a passion for fishing and we wound up fishing together and then be, wrote a few songs together and he really pulled me into his his crew and that's what opened really every door in Nashville for me. Anna? And for me, um, honestly, it was... Meeting me. Writing the song. You know, <laughs> well, it kind of was in some ways, you know, indirectly. So we wrote those songs, you know, those first couple songs I told you about, which got me on the path of writing with all kinds of people. And that led to me getting my first publishing deal, um, which was with a, a company called 1010 Music. They were Austra or Australia, New Zealand based uh, folks who had moved to Nashville and started this company. And they moved here also because they had strong ties to Keith Urban. And so Keith Urban wrote at the same publishing company that I got signed to. So I guess that was kind of like my big break um, in terms of like really doing professional music business. And then of course, with Keith in the picture at my publishing company and with Keith at my publishing company um, and me knowing Monty and us writing songs, that's how the three of us sort of became, you know, connected. All right. So let me start with uh, asking you a new question. Uh, as you were talking about this creative process, I'd like to know what you go through in trying to create a song. Do you create a song thinking about the person you're writing it for? Do you do you create a song thinking about something that happened in your life? What actually is happening in the creative process? Yeah. I think that that's one of those D all of the above, <laughs> you know, that we know from high school. Yeah. Uh, it, there's really so many avenues mm. into the creative process. Um, often we are specifically writing for an artist in mind. And so those are the boundaries and the parameters that we're working with. Um, many times we're just sitting down and trying to work out what we want to say to the world today. And uh, oftentimes we find ourselves in relationship kind of rights like, uh, Anna and myself or someone that you write with over the years where there's a tremendous comfort zone to, to be able to go in and just, you know, kind of create spontaneously and let whatever the day has that moment deliver to you. Anna? Um, you know, everything that Monty said is, is true. Um, to my process, uh, a lot of my, you know, start for a song really just comes from me sort of being connected to my instrument and, you know, which is the piano and, you know, playing around and finding if I fumble myself into something interesting melodically that feels like what I want to say to the world that day. Um, Cause my process is a little twofold. I do the process that Monty just talked about when we're working with other artists, but then when I'm writing for my own stuff, my own records, um, it's a much more personal uh, internal process. So it's usually there's something that I want to say or get out, um, met from, a, you know, a message perspective or just a working it out <laughs> through a song. And so I will usually start and go to the piano and try to find inspiration musically first and then, um, apply the subject that's been haunting me or whatever that I feel I need to write about. <laughs> <laughs> and and do you find that your mood actually has an effect on your music, whether you're happy or sad or? Absolutely. For me, it does. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm doing a, a, a song that's specifically tailored toward a record I'm making or, you know, my own particular artistry, um, less when you're working with another artist, because it's usually about where they're at yes. and you're trying we are trying as songwriters and co-writers to be more in the service industry in, in that perspective and help them get what they want to say out. Mm -hmm. So then we're it's a little more technical and a little more craft and a little more like, um, you know, we, I always call songwriting sessions, therapy sessions <laughs> with, with uncertified psychologists, <laughs> you know, people are just talking and trying to work out their stuff um, in conversation so that it can be put into a song. All right. So a question for both of you individually, can you tell me what maybe, maybe one of the low points in your life and, and what effect did it have on your music? Hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, do you want to go first? Sure. <laughs> okay. Sure. Um, we tend to write our way into and out of uh, the highs and lows. Um, and, I, you know, just being fully transparent here, uh, one of the low points in my life was being in love with this woman and, and not, not being able to be with her. And that took a long time to work itself out. And, and it did work itself out uh, for the good of everyone involved. But there was a long period of time where um, that's beautiful. All of the music that I, was, that I was writing and all the music that she was writing was really reflecting um, where we were at, where we were at yeah. in, in trying to find a way to be able to have uh, this relationship. So, yes, yeah, so there's a period of songs there that really speak mostly to that. It's our blue period, <laughs> I guess you could say. Uh, extremely confessional, you know, songs. Mm-hmm. Um which in my opinion um, have the most potency uh, art- from an artistic perspective. Um, I tend to enjoy writing confessional songs. Okay, uh, give, me, give me a song. What was one of your more memorable moments behind one of your songs? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, from this like sort of blue period that you mean or just in general either from one. anything? Okay. My buddy Keith Urban, who I've written so many songs with over the years, uh, we actually got a call uh, from a movie company that had uh, already shot and basically had a final edit of this movie called Act of Valor that starred actual in-service Navy SEALs. And um, they wanted an end title song for that movie. And we got to watch that footage and create based on that. And it was just one of the most powerful things that I had ever seen uh, because of the story of, of what these special forces folks were going through. Keep us safe every day. We have no idea what they're doing out there on the front lines. Uh, And it was just a real wake up call. And it was a real challenge for me and Keith for a couple of days, we, we really couldn't get up and going because we're trying to be optimistic about America and our place in the world and what our SEALs are doing and how they're taking care of us. And yet we're desperately trying to write a song that's not pro-war or like rah, rah, go kill them, you know? So we were walking a very fine line between there's casualty, war is just a casualty all the way around. And yet how do we shine a light on these special people from our country who are doing this? And so it was a, it was a thing. And and what song came out of that? The song that came out of that is a song called for you. And it's the end title for the movie act of valor. Uh, The song was nominated for best original song in a motion picture. And I was actually nominated for a golden globe award for it. So yeah, we got to go. (laughs) It was awesome. We got to go and, you know, Get all dressed up and walk the red carpet. And Adele won that. Year. <laughs> How about for you, Anna? Um, for me, you know, I'd have to say it's my song, A House of Home, which I wrote and was the international theme song for Habitat for Humanity. Um, you know, we went and we did a build, uh, a Habitat build in Nashville, where we built 10 houses in five days. And I did not think that was possible. But on Sunday, we were digging foundations. And by Friday morning, they were giving keys to partner families who'd never had, you know, a real first full single family home before. And um, uh, about Tuesday of the build, they they came to me and said, oh, we heard you're a singer songwriter. And would you be willing to uh, sing a song or two at the key ceremony when we give the keys to the families? And I go, yeah, that would be amazing. I Sure, I'd love to. And then I go home and I'm thinking, well, what song am I going to sing that's going to like sort of fit this occasion, you know, because I'm, it's really important to me to match the narrative of what you're singing and saying at a particular event or a concert or whatever you're preparing for, you know, that there's some message in it for the people that are there. And so I didn't think my little love, random love song, confessional love songs about heartbreak were going to, you know, work. So I wrote a song um, 
in those next couple days of the build uh, when I would go home at night. And it was real reflective of the experience we were having. And when I performed it on Friday at the key ceremony, the folks from Habitat International were there because it was it was kind of a big PR event in Nashville, uh, giving these 10 homes in one week. And um, they said, man, that song really embodies our message. And we'd love to talk to you about maybe using it for our organization. And so that's when, you know, an experience where, you know, having an experience, writing about it, sharing it with people and thinking it was just going to be for that. And then having it turn into something much larger that was able to do a lot more good in the world. That was really a cool thing. So it's interesting. Both of you told the story that where you were almost navigating a little bit of politics. Um, and and you, yeah. uh, Monty, you were navigating it in this concept of war. Um, and you know, I just came back from Israel and, and up on the wall in, in Gaza. And you're right. You know, no matter what, there is no good version of war. War is a is a really bad, horrible thing that has incredible negative effects on lots of different people. But yet there are these heroes, and trying to navigate that was interesting. Are there other political areas that you end up having to navigate? I, I notice most of your songs are very patriotic. Yeah, 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 I, yeah certainly. We've our Americana duo, Troubadour Seventy Seven. Uh, we we started that specifically to be able to write and create songs that had more uh, socially active messages that resonated with us that we didn't really have a vehicle to be able to put forward. Uh, again, as Anna said, she's had more of her own uh, solo artistic career, but this was the vehicle for us to be able, I think, to really speak to some of the things that we felt like we wanted to say in our music, I mean, we're both uh, come from and enamored by the mm -hmm. singer songwriter, you know, Laurel Canyon movement and the and the the songs from the '70s and stuff. And so, uh, social commentary was something that we did not see a lot mm -hmm. in the vertical of sort of where we were making a living in country music. Uh, in fact, it was maybe actively even shied away from, uh, so as not to be seen as being divisive. Um, but we had some things on our hearts that we felt like we wanted to say, and we felt the best way to do that was to actually create this musical vehicle um, to do it. And so we made a couple of, of records that really gave us that platform to speak freely. Anna? Yeah. Um, you know, to second what Monty said, uh, that period of creating music that felt like it was uh, – Commenting, yeah, commenting on on, on the on the current state of the world was very important. So you know we have songs about gun violence. We have songs about uh, the earth and global warming. We have songs about uh, uh, immigration. We have songs about uh, civil rights. Uh, Monty wrote a, a great song about John Lewis, uh, who is his hero because Monty's from Georgia, and the great Congressman John Lewis. Uh, there and uh he wrote a wonderful song um just sort of honoring mm -hmm. the the whole freedom rider freedom movement freedom rider mm -hmm. movement called yeah. freedom rider and um and you know i think um that was real liberating to be able to to do that um to say what we felt like we needed to say and we felt like songs were the best place to do that and what has been interesting is that um all the ish the, at some level, those songs are evergreen and will be evergreen. Yes. I mean, I was really hoping that we would like do it and people would hear it and there would be, there would be a lot of change, but they are still as applicable as they were in 2016 and 2017. Or, or in 1968. Them, or in yeah. 1968. Hey, uh, I have a picture of the bus with the Freedom Riders after it was burnt out. And I, I use that all the time to try to, when people come through, to remind them that the civil rights movement wasn't just done by the black community. There were many, yeah. many people who participated. There were pastors and priests and African-Americans and Hispanics and Jewish members and white people, uh, all of whom believed in the cause that every person was worthy of dignity and that, that we shouldn't treat any group of people differently or worse. 
uh, and many people sacrifice for that. But that's that's beautiful. The, uh, the listening to those comments because it is a little bit of a mixture between the '60s and '70s and modern, current right. uh, country western music. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I, and I don't feel country artists are tackling any of those issues. The only issue they do it is in a very thirty thousand foot view of go America, <laughs> you know, like and and just the sort of general sound cliched sound bites. But I don't know of any artists um, in today's modern music, uh, particularly country, that are really saying, you know, I've got a song about this issue, you know, and this is what, you know. Um, so that was important to us to sort of tackle some of the things a little deeper. Yeah, to be less broad and to, yeah. to paint with a finer pen yeah. than some of the sort of whitewashy, big brush things that are sort of easy to get behind, mm -hmm. but don't really start to delve into some of the, you know, the hard questions and the hard conversations you have to have to move forward. You know, I, I see it as political capital. Um, each of us come with a certain amount of capital and financial capital, political capital. But if you if if you're only willing to be supportive of those things that give you more capital, you don't accomplish change. You, you may accomplish more money, but you're not going to really create change. If your goal is to create change, sometimes you have to be willing to expend some capital. And that's what leadership is all about. It's being out in front, being willing to, to sacrifice yourself. And it's just wonderful to hear that. Okay, so have you ever had pressure from anyone to change any of your lyrics that you didn't want to do? I haven't. Um, you may have. I haven't. I haven't had pressure simply because... I never really tried to fit that into that vehicle. Uh, we spoke earlier about, yeah. you know, there's a particular version of songwriting that we, we do for a living that's a little bit more in service to the artist and in service to the song. And so I have been in many co-writes where I knew that there were things that before I even walked into that room that we weren't going to say or, or, or weren't going to be topics of discussion. Um, and... So I, I have never really specifically been in a position where I was adamant about, I think we need to, to say this, and someone was pressuring me back and going, no, I don't feel like that we should, we should be saying that and, and having this happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was a sort of like a pre-decision. There are also rooms that I will not walk into because I know well, that that's going to be an yeah. issue. And mm -hmm. so it's right. just a pre-decision that's made. Anna? Right. I mean, I, I, I think pretty much what Monty said is, is the case, you know, um, you know, if, if, if you know something about a potential co-writer or an artist that you just don't, or we just don't align with and feel like they may be wanting to write something about, you know, we, we would probably just gracefully decline the opportunity to, to write with them because at the end of the day, I hate to say it, they're the artist and they're the ones who are going to have the final say. So if you become a writer in a thing and you're not okay with what is being said, um, you know, you don't have as much control over what, what can be put out there and what you can be associated with. So it's almost like you sort of have to pre-vet, um, you know, I think what you're, what you're walking into, if you feel like it could be real volatile. Mm -hmm. And we've just always been really good at navigating to not put ourselves in, in that bad of a, of a position, yeah. you know. Have you ever had your music or your lyrics misinterpreted? All the time. Oh, yeah. All the time. Yeah. Er, early on when we came out with the T-77, Troubadour 77 stuff, the first song that we released is a song called American Revival. Um which you should listen to if you haven't had a chance to. I will. And it went out into the world and onto social media. And you can look at the initial chain mm -hmm. of people reacting to it with entirely opposite takes on what it was that, that we were meaning. Like there would be a post there saying, I love American Revival, you know, love the fact that you're trying to shine a light on on how we need to get back to this beautiful, multicultural, inclusive place that we used to be. 
and or two, that we want or be. that we want to be, and then two threads below it would be someone who would come on love American revival. What's going on right now in our country while we're taking it back and making sure that it is the way it was fifty yeah. years ago is so important. <laughs> and we're like, what? How did you get that from that? You yeah. Know? So and so that's the very injured. You know, it's like even when you intend and you think you're being clear, somebody who just wants to hear hear it with the ears that they want to hear it with. That's what they're going to get out mm-hmm. of it, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, so that can be a little bit like, oh my gosh, how did that happen? You know? Oh, I think I do it all the time. <laughs> you know, I'll find a song I love. It's beautiful. It appeals to me. And then somehow or another, I figure out how those words are applying to what was happening in my life as opposed to what right. maybe the artist really intended. Yeah. yeah. But in some ways, I mean, okay, take it out of the, you know, sort of political framing of that, but like, let's just say it's a love song or, um, you know, I think, I think that the cat, that can be a good thing in music um, too, because, you know, an artist or a writer might, it means what it means to them when they write it. But, and this has been a very interesting lesson that we have learned as artists and songwriters is once it's out there and once it's released and once somebody hears it, it becomes this thing that takes on a life of its own and people interpret the story inside of that song that they need to hear for their life. Don't you think that your music, some that music can have healing powers? Oh, absolutely. Completely. You know? And I mean, like, you know, cause there could be a song somebody writes and um, the a person hears it and they get this crazy, wonderful blessing and healing and that songwriter didn't even mean for it to mean that, but it meant that to that person. And so that is sort of the good version of when something might be potentially misinterpreted or whatever. Um, because so there's 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 two sides to that 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 knife, so to speak. Monty? <laughs> the edge of knife. We're yeah, we're amazing. constantly making music and we're constantly being healed by other people's music. Mm-hmm. And our own. And, and our own. Yeah. You know, as we revisit things or as we create things that are specifically meant to be cathartic for us in the process of creation, and and then we make the decision to share it with the world. There's also catalogs of music standing right mm-hmm. behind us here that we will never put out to the public. It's not intended for them. It was intended for us or for some a particular moment in our lives and we used our creative process around that. So I think it's a beautiful full circle kind of a thing that as creators, we know we're creating stuff that are healing people. And as listeners and receivers, we're also receiving the healing that's coming from the other creators that are also doing it. Yeah. It's such a fascinating thing to think about. Like I can't remember my password sometimes given to me an hour ago, but I can remember a song (laughs) I heard the 1960s. Sure. We could all sing American Pie, uh-huh. top to bottom, <laughs> right now. And it's an eight-minute long song, yeah. and we would sing every word of it. Yep. Yeah. All right. So um, any stories or instances that you recall where uh, where people actually came to you and, and thanked you for the music that you had written, either being medicinal for them or being helpful to them in their life? Yeah. Um, you know, I uh, I made some jazz records uh there for a bit and um you know i had uh a couple that was at a a jazz they were at the park city jazz festival they discovered me there and that was it and and then um about i'd say gosh six or seven years later uh i was playing somewhere nearby their hometown and they came out because they remembered me uh from the festival and they bought my records and and they they said, man, we listen to your, uh, it was the Time Changes Everything album that I made. Um, we listen to it every Sunday morning. It's like tradition. We wake up, we have our coffee, we put you on, we watch CBS Sunday morning. We did, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, you know, that's, and she says, it just gives us the best start to our week. We love, I have a song on there called Sentimental Sundays. And so they start with that, you know, because they just feel like it, and it's become sort of their um, routine or something. And I thought, oh my God, I never, never thought that, you know, that, that would 
That's You'd cool. hear that back. It was just so nice to hear that back. And mm -hmm. so that was just a really positive, lighthearted story. But it's just like, wow, you just make me feel comfortable when I listen to that record or that music. And so that's a really good feeling. And you had a great experience in Colorado once, many years ago, when you were on tour with Diamond Rio about um, your song. Yeah, I'd written a number Billy one Ray song Cyrus. for Billy Ray Cyrus called uh, Could Have Been Me. It was the, the number one song directly after Achy Breaky Heart. Yeah. So, uh, and this was, a, this was like a really serious song. So you get Achy Breaky Heart. The next thing you've got is this thing could have been me about lost love and a lost opportunity. And uh, yeah, I was, I was uh, in a sporting goods store in, in Colorado. Uh, I was out with Diamond Rio and I just went to uh, pick up some stuff. And a guy stopped me in uh, the aisle and had recognized me from seeing, seeing me on TV with the band and said, are you Monty Powell, the songwriter? And I was like, this is before you had to be scared. You know, I was like, yeah. <laughs> who wants to yeah, know? yeah, 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 yeah. Well, now I would go, yeah, who wants to know? Um, and, and he said that song, that Billy Ray Cyrus song could have been me. He said, uh, you wrote that song about me. And I'm like, I'm, dude, I, I'm sure I don't know you. And he said, and, and in the second verse, um, the guy's in love with the love of his life. He buys an engagement ring, but he's the kind who just can't quite get to the point where he asks the girl to marry him. And the relationship falls apart. She moves on and, and it never happens. And, and one day he finds the engagement ring actually in, in the drawer and remembering the mistake he made by not, not going with his feelings. And he says, I'm that guy. He says, I had the love of my life. I have the ring. It's in the drawer at my house. Oh, wow. That song, my story, but you don't, you don't owe me, no, you know, no. and, it, and then I'm, I'm introducing myself to you in the sporting goods aisle of this store in Colorado randomly. So, I mean, that was, yeah. you know, that was, but, but he thanked you for writing it. Yeah, it said, was like, yeah, it gave him like, some healing. It, it gave me, know. it gave me some healing to, to, you know, not hear it out one. there in the world to know that I'm not the only one who maybe had that experience. Not alone. Yeah. I found in yeah. politics, people do need to be connected. It's it's maybe as, as important as the issues to feel that they've been heard. When I was mayor of Phoenix, I remember I was out at this place one day and this guy came up. I was, I was mayor at 30 years old. And this guy comes up to me and he says, hey, young fella, he says, anybody ever tell you you look a lot like Mayor Paul Johnson? So I smiled and I said, well, what would you say if I told you I was Mayor Paul Johnson? And he said, he goes, well, I'd call you a darn liar because I know him personally. But the, uh, <laughs> but right. you know, the, wow. I just went along with him. But the yeah, the cool. issue is people want to feel connected. And music does that in a way in which you can't do in politics, you can't do in, in writing. I mean, it's just a very, very unique way to do it, to connect to someone in three to five minutes. What you guys yeah. do is amazing. So I want to know about song stars. Tell me about uh, Song Stars and the inspiration behind that. Sure. Um, we, as songwriters, we're not necessarily always performers, but some of us have this sort of dual life, like we love to perform, but we also, I mean, I'm known for writing hits for Keith Urban. You, you know, you would have never seen my name on a marquee as playing as Monty Powell. Um, and... Until Troubadour 77. Until Troubadour 77. <laughs> but we, we really wanted to create a vehicle for songwriters to be able to feel like that they belonged on the stage. And while we have these listening room clubs and things like the Bluebird Cafe and places like that in Nashville that are small and intimate and you can come see two or three, you know, folks on a guitar or piano sing their songs, it's kind of been limited to that. And so we created Song Stars because we felt like that songwriters and their processes and their stories were just as valid and belonged on a Broadway stage or a, or a performance arts theater stage as, as anything else. And we've been really passionate about it. And so we created the, the, the Song Stars show to kind of fulfill that need that we saw. All right. So... Uh, Song Stars was uh, the desire to try and help other artists who were writing songs to feel like they're a part of it. So, so talk to me about um, 
these different artists all coming from different backgrounds, how that works and, and, and what's been your experience with it? We were, we were very inspired by the Springsteen on Broadway uh, play. That's my Bruce Springsteen t-shirt I'm wearing today. Um, and we love learned it. that that uh, show was scripted. That's when a real light bulb went off for us on Song Stars. Um, because Bruce made it look so natural. We just thought he was talking off the cuff like a lot of the Bluebird shows do. But we learned that it was scripted. And that is when it got real exciting to us because we decided to, yes, we need to write a script. Write a script about our story, inserting the different songs, which is a very different process than your typical songwriter Bluebird show. Because a lot of that is very impromptu and you know, just sort of off the cuff. And this, if you go see this in Peoria, Illinois, and then you go to, you know, Tampa Bay the next night, it will be the exact same show because it is scripted. And so our process of writing a script was new and uh, we had a lot to learn because that we've never done that before, Um, but we learned a lot and we did a lot of rewrites. So the writing and the rewriting of it and the also we did two residencies. We did a residency in Bryce Canyon, Utah in the summer of 21. And then then last summer, we did a residency uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, And we learned about different kinds of audiences and what they, you know, how they react and what they want. And we rewrote a little bit more. So the workshopping of something that is a property and an actual show, as opposed to something that is different every night in every different city. That was a real, a real neat thing to be involved in. And um, now something that we sort of have forever that we can just sort of perform that show if, if that's what the calling is, is, you know, so that was real exciting. All right. I know you all both have talked about maybe playing a song or two for us. I'd love to hear you do that if you're willing. Yeah, you bet. Absolutely. You yeah. Grab a guitar here. Grab that guitar, Monty. <laughs> so, all right. You tell Any me about requests? This <laughs> yeah. I don't do piano, man. <laughs> I'll let I'll let you pick any song that you want. In fact, tell, play for me the favorite one that you two like to do together. It maybe had the most meaning in your life. Sure. We, yeah. we love doing this song together because of the harmonies and stuff. And um, I always say the same thing as I introduce uh, this song. Uh, this is a number one song, four-week number one song that I wrote with Keith Urban. Um, but my favorite part about this song is that it's true. And, and if we know anything, particularly in the world that we live in today, time flies by so fast. It's gone in an instant. And... Uh, and if you're going to live, you better start living right now. And, and that's what this song really encourages people to do. It's called Days Go By. I'm changing lanes. I'm talking on the phone. I'm driving way too fast. The interstate's jammed with gunners like me. Afraid of coming in last. Somewhere in the race we run, we're coming under. The days go by. I can feel them flying like a hand out the window in the wind. The cars go by, and it's all we've been given. So you better start living right now. Cause days go by. Talk about tomorrow, then it slips away. We dream about forever, but people, we only have today. And I'll tell you why. Because the days go by. I can feel them flying like a hand out the window as the cars go by. And it's all we've been given, so you better start living. You better start living, better start living right now. Cause days go by, I can feel them flying like a hand out the window in the wind. The cars go by, and it's 
it's all we've been given. See, let's start living right now. Cause days go by. Ooh. So take them by the hand and yours and mine. Take them by the hand and live your life. Take them by the hand, don't let them all fly by. Oh, come on, come on, baby. That's great. Uh, I, I, you know what? I love it. An audience of one. I think this is my favorite concert I've ever been to. <laughs> you know, when, when uh, COVID was happening and everybody was in lockdown, we did all these, you know, uh, shows on the internet, you know, and people would log in through Facebook or, or Instagram or whatever, YouTube. And it was like, we'd be done the song. And we didn't even get that applause, Paul, because you're just like into an iPhone and you're hoping someone's out there listening. <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. All right. So, Anna, is that your favorite also or do you have a different one that's your favorite? Oh, well, I mean, that's actually one of my favorites of Monty's that he's written. And, you know, I'd have to say that my favorite is the House of Home song that we talked about earlier, um, just because of the it's just given me so many great experiences. Like we got to build a home, well, several homes with the, at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter work project, the 25th anniversary down in Mississippi after Katrina had hit. And we got to build homes alongside of president Carter and the first lady, God rest her soul, who just recently passed. Um, and uh, that was, that was a hot, that was like top, um, top five, experiences they were so inspiring I and mean, she walked around at the end of every day and picked up with her bare hands nails and screws that were you know just on the construction site inside the actual house so no one would get hurt and i'm just it was such a great example of real leadership real leadership and service mm -hmm. you know and then um garth brooks and trisha yearwood were, were also on that field um, we got to perform the song the night before for all the people involved. And it was just really cool. And and there were many other experiences too in around the country, but like that one specifically was super special um, as well as the, the actual one we did in Nashville that inspired the whole thing to begin with. So I'd have to say House of Home is probably my, my favorite and most rewarding song just because it's been able to do some good work in the world. I, I don't know if you're willing to play that, but before you do, um, have you found when you, is your sense when you go around the country and when you're talking to people, when you're engaged in different social projects as well as playing your music, do you see that there's an ability for this country to come back together, to unify? Do you think our politics uh, and what we're watching on television exaggerates how big the problem is? Or do you think that it actually is symbolic of, uh, of the problem? I believe that it, it reflects the problem. And I believe that the arts are a mirror to what we actually are. Yeah. Um, Which is inherently good. I mean, I think there's a lot of people that, you know, when they hear a song like House of Home or, you know, you have a song about Alzheimer's, you know, that you wrote for the Alzheimer's Association. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people, they want to attached to the idealism or the romanticism of the best, our better angels. But speaking to what you're asking about the, the media and the messaging and the, the things that are coming through now, I think what you're saying is I think probably the, the, the world is, is, so si is so siloed and in yeah. such specific cordoned off echo chambers. Yeah. Um, I'm not a, a nihilist, but I'm damn close at this point in time. Uh, I think it's a really, really enormous uphill climb and shake up uh, for us to maybe find ourselves standing shoulder and shoulder the way uh, that perhaps it was in, intended. You know, my yeah, my belief is we've put a too big of an emphasis on politics. Look, politics, there's always divisions in politics, right? They're, they're just, they're just are. That's the place where we go to resolve our problems. And we don't put enough emphasis on things like 
music and art and our family and uh, and our community and how we can help out other people. There, there, there are incredible places where we can agree and work together and help one another. But if we put our entire life, if our entire life's focus is on politics, which is what you're watching on the news, it's going to feel a lot more negative than it really is. So this song, I, I, I know this song. I, I spent a lot of time in Habitat for Humanity. Um, during the time I was mayor, I worked real hard to try to get them a large parcel of property out in uh, South Phoenix. And there was a guy by the name of Jerry Bisgrove who was like an incredible lobbyist for them at the time. He was a very big high net worth guy, but he also loved Habitat. And we did a similar project where we went out and worked. I don't remember how many homes it was, but we did them in five days. And then when you hand the keys over to people, it's such an emotional experience. But I want to hear it. I'd love to hear you guys sure, play that song. Absolutely. All right. Here goes. <laughs> Stone by stone, we built a place to call our own. I'm gonna fill it up with laughter at my happy ever after. Cause for the first time in my life, I'm holding the key to a brand new life waiting on me. Gotta welcome that. At the front door of my dreams Gonna fill all the rooms with my favorite things Photos of the family Keepsakes and alternates Oh, but most of all I'm gonna make sure that love Moves in as a later House a home If you really want to know That's what makes a House a home Every time I walk Through the door I'm reminded A little more That it's something to be proud of a place to hang my head of shelter from the storms where I can lay my burdens down. Yeah, that's really what makes a Home. That's what makes a house a home. Hey. Okay, Monty, I got to say something to you. I now know why you fell head over heels in love with her. <laughs> Oh, you're sweet. <laughs> and, and Monty, I know why you were depressed when it wasn't working out. Oh, this is becoming clear to me. <laughs> it's all coming clear. And uh, it's all in the songs too there. I promise you. Guys, that is Thanks. beautiful. Both of you are. So I would well, like I to thank it. you for bringing joy into so many people's hearts. I mean, oftentimes they hear it through some other artist. But the, I do believe, you know, I, I, our, the name of our program is The Optimistic American, and it's just trying to remind people of the good things that are going on. You two are definitely one of the good things going on in America. So I just want to thank um, you for all that you do. Thank you so thank much, you so Paul. Much. And likewise to you. Thank you, you for bringing such a great message out there over the podcast airways for people to find these, you know, Americana stories that are all over the all, all over and you just have to find them and shine a light on them and we appreciate what you're doing as well so all right, thank if, you if people wanted to follow you or to 
uh, to keep up with what you're doing? How would they do that? Yeah. Um, so our websites and of, of course, all our, we have social handles for all of it, but mostly uh, it's, you know, Anna Wilson and Monty Powell, our names, and then um, dot com. And then uh, our Americana duo, which we do together um, and probably has the most sort of, um, you know, a lot of the things we talked about today are on those records. And that's Troubadour 7, sorry, excuse me, Troubadour77.com. And that's spelled P-R-O-U-B-A-D-O-U-R, like the famous Troubadour in Los Angeles. So Troubadour77.com. Well, Anna and Monty, thank you so much for being on our show. I definitely could have spent the entire rest of the afternoon listening to you. And, and, uh, and Monty, you so hang on to her. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're hanging on tight here. I've got songs in my back pocket just waiting in case I need to pull them out and get them back. <laughs> Damn, that sounds like, I, I wish I had one of those for my wife. That's awesome. <laughs> well, just call us up. Give we'll us, lend you one. Exactly. <laughs> Give us a buzz. Okay, Thank you guys. so much. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining the Optimistic American Show. To help us grow by subscribing to our channel. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave a like and a comment. There is so much more that we have planned. We can't wait for you to embark upon this journey with us.